The 1990s was a revolutionary time period for creative-driven cartoons. Nickelodeon led the charge with shows such as Doug and Rugrats, but nothing quite compared to the unbridled chaos of Ren and Stimpy. For those who know about this show, I can imagine you're already reminiscing about the over-the-top expressions and high-quality animation of this series. It was a caliber of cartoon that was unlike anything else, and it put Nickelodeon on the map. However, the production of this show, led by its creator, John Crickfalusi, was plagued with issues that ranged from missing deadlines, fighting network executives, enraging advertisers, and overworking artists to the point of exhaustion. But none of these problems compared to the alleged abuse of John towards his victims, Robin Bird and Katie Rice, two girls who suffered at the hands of John during his reign, with many people at the time knowing about this open secret, but doing nothing about it. A story so disturbing that it effectively destroyed the legacy of John Kay, along with the reputation of one of the most influential cartoons of the 1990s a show that had a meteoric rise that was followed by utter collapse. So, let's take a closer look and find out what ruined Ren and Stimpy. The Ren and Stimpy show was created by Canadian animator John Crickfalusi, better known as John Kay. Originally born in a suburb of Quebec, Canada, John was obsessed with drawing and the magic of seeing how animation worked after something as simple as putting together a Huckleberry Hound flipbook, John was hooked on the spot. He briefly went to Sheridan College in Ontario, but found the educational system restrictive and stifling towards his creativity. After he was expelled for not attending classes, John moved to LA, determined to enter the animation industry using his own drive and talent. He was also lucky enough to be in the network of his two animation heroes, Bob Clampett and Ralph Bakshi. Clampett was one of the original lead animators helming Looney Tunes shorts in the 1930s and 40s. He had a love of surrealistic art, violent slapstick, and playfully messing with the censors. Ralph Bakshi is an independent, adult-oriented animator who created such films as Fritz the Cat, Cool World, and American Pop, and that is adult with a capital A. His movies frequently dealt with racism, sex, violence, politics, and the urban decay of America in the 1970s. Knowing all this, it is no wonder John got along with them so well. Clampett pulled some strings in his network and helped John find gigs working for studios such as Filmation, Hanna-Barbera, and Deke. The work was steady, but formulaic and dull, with John wanting to expand into more expressive, fluid animation. Luckily, Ralph reached out to John in 1987, offering him a supervising and directing role on Mighty Mouse, the new adventures for CBS. With Ralph's guidance, John gained valuable experience managing teams and seeing the complete pipeline of an episode's creation to the final cut. He spent a year working on Mighty Mouse before moving on to another project, the new adventures of Beanie and Cecil on ABC. It was an animated episodic reboot of the classic 1960s TV series, helmed by the Clampett family. The show was caught in the midst of negotiations with ABC, as Bob had passed away in 1984, and his family was struggling to find the right developer for the job. In 1988, the Clampets insisted on having John Kay brought on board as part of the deal, as he knew how to capture the same style of Bob's animation. There were a number of delays and issues between John and the network. After airing only five episodes, the new adventures of Beanie and Cecil was canceled due to creative differences. And yes, this will be a recurring theme in the video, so sit tight. However, he still had the support of the Clampett family, and more importantly, met a wide array of people while working there. John invited them to join him after Beanie and Cecil ended creating their own independent animation studio dubbed Spumco. Originally consisting of artists Bob Camp, Lynn Naylor, Jim Smith, and John Kay, Spumco was a rowdy group of animators scrapping by, but fed up with the stale and boring work that dominated TV animation. Allegedly, the building they had purchased as their headquarters was originally a converted brothel used by Paramount, complete with cramped dark rooms but they made do. 
teaming up with Croyer Films to animate a lively title sequence for the comedy film Troop Beverly Hills in 1989. A few months later, Spumco would get the opportunity of a lifetime. In the trades for creator-driven cartoon pitches, John brought some of his ideas to Nickelodeon. John met with the vice president of animation production, Vanessa Kofi, and presented three concepts to her. Most of them flopped, but Vanessa was intrigued by two unusual characters, a dog and a cat, who were supposed to be the pets of a child from this show idea called Your Gang. John Kay originally created the characters for Ren and Stimpy in 1978 while in college. The design for Ren was based off an Elliot Erwitt photograph postcard called New York City 1946, showing a goofy-looking chihuahua in a sweater. Stimpy was inspired by A Gruesome Twosome, a 1945 Tweety Bird cartoon directed by Bob Clampett, featuring some bulbous nose cats. Vanessa loved their designs and wanted them to have their own show, asking John to create a pilot with the rest of the Spumco team. John had done it. This was his chance to shake up the animation industry with a talented team of artists he knew could deliver on such out there ideas. The pilot titled Big House Blues was finished and gained a ton of positive buzz on the film festival circuit leading up to the series premiere. Ren and Stimpy was on its way to becoming one of the original Nicktoons, joining the 1991 lineup along with Klasky Chupo's Rugrats and Jumbo Film's Doug. And yeah, one of these cartoons was definitely not like the others. Rugrats was a slice-of-life show exploring the world of imaginative toddlers. Doug was a quirky, understated story following a boy's journey through middle school. Ren and Stimpy was completely insane. And let's be honest, not really for children. But hey, that was half the fun of it. Now, I did some digging and actually found some legal precedent for why Nickelodeon was looking for such a diverse array of shows. In 1990, the Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, passed a mandate called the Children's Television Act. It required networks oriented towards children to foster positive social and cognitive development through their programs. Basically, having wholesome and sincere messaging incorporated into the storytelling designed to turn kids into more emotionally well-rounded adults. A lot of this stemmed from the uh, carbon copy Saturday morning cartoons from the 1980s and how they were just trying to sell toys. Now today, this is pretty standard practice with morals or life lessons being routinely integrated into most mainstream children's media. And at the time, both Doug and Rugrats seemed to accomplish these goals pretty easily. Rugrats would cover subjects that little kids would be worried about, like sibling rivalry or facing your fears. Doug covered things more oriented towards middle schoolers, like going out on a first date or having body image issues. Ren and Stimpy was primarily intended to be about entertainment, point blank, and John Kay did not want to sugarcoat anything. He believed that kids were tougher and more capable of handling dark subject matter than the executives of the network gave them credit for. Now, there's definitely some truth in that, but mostly he wasn't willing to overhaul the stories he wanted to do just to appease some corporate mandate. However, any program that did not attempt to follow this rule could risk getting canceled for any future seasons. Also, they could not advertise any products from the show that was airing at the time. Uh, for example, no Rugrats-themed toy ads during an episode. But even with these limitations, nobody could have expected the massive impact that Ren and Stimpy would make, changing the TV animation landscape forever. Originally premiering on August 11th, 1991, The Ren and Stimpy Show follows the episodic adventures of Ren Hoik, a psychotic, high-strung, asthma-hound chihuahua, and Stimson J. Cat, an incredibly stupid but loving Manx cat. Using absurdist humor and exaggerated slapstick, each episode would follow Ren and Stimpy encountering new scenarios and conflicts in a variety of locations. The show also had a group of recurring segments and fake in-universe ads like Ask Dr. Stupid and Powdered Toast Man. 
Though they had a volatile relationship, Stimpy was endlessly loving and tolerant of Rin's outburst. And deep down, Rin genuinely loved Stimpy for being such a supportive friend. Did he have a weird, violent way of showing it? Yeah, constantly. But they were a fun duo, working off of each other's strengths and weaknesses to get out of trouble or make a quick buck. Despite being on a network intended for children, Ren and Stimpy also had a lot of appeal towards adults. They loved the bizarre, highly expressive animation, memorable side characters, and off-putting stories, which was a stark contrast to the other shows on Nickelodeon at the time. The humor is also widely unique. I have never seen another show that goes so far out of its way to consistently make the audience uncomfortable. For me, I was a kid during the 90s, and when I watched this show, there were times where I would physically pull back away from the screen, struggling to understand what I was even watching. But when it's funny, it is unbelievably funny, especially if you can handle disgusting and cringy situations. Rin and Stimpy almost immediately became a ratings juggernaut for Nickelodeon. In its first season, they had double, sometimes tripled, the ratings of other Nicktoons on the platform. From 1991 to 1992, it was the most popular cable TV show on any network. With all this positive reception, you would think they'd be printing off mugs like nobody's business, right? Uh, surprisingly, Red and Stampy did not have much in the way of merchandising at first. I know this sounds pretty shocking today, what with Nickelodeon's aggressive marketing of Spongebob being plastered onto any product you can think of. You know, he may as well be the American version of Hello Kitty at this point. But at the time, they were attempting to be proactive and not have any overexploitive merchandise. <laughs> uh, don't worry, that did not last long. It's still the 90s after all. Just a few years later, Ren and Stimpy merchandise failed retail shelves. T-shirts, Halloween costumes, video games, plush toys, food tie-ins, you name it. On the production end, things were looking up. At the start of season one, John Kay had a supportive relationship with Vanessa Kofi, the same programming executive and Nick responsible for greenlighting the show in the first place. They had a surprisingly wholesome camaraderie. Vanessa appreciated John's passion and craftsmanship as an integral draw for the show. And John recognized the power of Vanessa advocating for them as a bridge between the other executives. But balancing all that creative energy needed support, with the other artists at Spumco, most notably Bob Camp, doing what they could to keep things on track. Bob Camp was John's second in command, frequently directing and storyboarding some of the most popular episodes of Ren and Stimpy, including Stimpy's invention. Other creative heads on board, like Lynn Naylor, Chris Riccardi, and Bill Ray, utilize each of their skills to flash out episodes with an incredible roster of talent. These artists were responsible for a lot of the striking visual cues that give Ren and Stimpy such a distinct look. Once more corporate suits got involved with weighing in on episode content and budgetary issues, tensions started to rise. Each episode became a tug of war between Spumco and the network. Scripts that were already approved and in production would get notes demanding changes and edits. Because of their solid working relationship, Vanessa would make deals with the studio, asking them to create some heartwarming, toned-down episodes to appease to other executives. Ever the shitstirrer, John Kay pushed the boundaries of both the network and the censors as far as he could get away with. John notoriously hated pathos, meaning episodes deliberately made to pull at your heartstrings. So, he would push them to their most absurd extreme to still keep his end of the bargain. This resulted in episodes like Son of Stimpy, where Stimpy goes on an emotional, desperate search to find his long-lost fart. It is so obviously dumb and gross that nobody should take it seriously. But episodes like that fulfill the quota they needed to do truly gross stuff in other episodes. Mostly, John saw Ren and Stimpy as the safest project he ever worked on. This did not last long, though. Gradually, communication started to break down, getting to the point where he would only communicate with the network through his lawyer. There were a number of reasons that warped Spumco's relationship with the network. But the most obvious of them was John Kay's unwavering, exhausting perfectionism. 
He had the final say over every single drawing, every layout, every keyframe of animation. Everything had to be approved by him first before going into production in accordance with his vision. Being a creator-driven show, most of the artists accepted this at first, as they all knew it was for the greater good and in service of producing the highest quality episodes possible. Many of them also cited that working on Ren and Stimpy greatly improved their skills as artists. The environment could be harsh, but it made them work even harder to win his approval and produce work of lasting quality. And with so much of the show's budget going to the animation, they had to cut costs somewhere, specifically the sound and music department. Their sound design was innovative, using unusual sound effects and outdated music, sometimes classical music from the public domain. John Kay himself provided the voice of Ren, with the rest of the Spumco staff filling in for the background characters. Billy West was hired to play Stimpy, as he had previously enjoyed working with John on The Beanie and Cecil Show. For Stimpy's voice, he opted to do his voice as a higher-pitched version of Larry from The Three Stooges. Keeping with the lack of tradition at Spumco, they did not actually use model sheets or lip-sync guides during production. This lack of consistency was exactly the vibe John Kay was looking for, with each pose being pushed to distorted but hilarious extremes. Body shapes would contort and squish to match each character's emotions, wanting them to emulate the same characters he loved watching growing up. One of the most iconic visual staples of Ren and Stimpy was incorporating a series of gorgeously painted but revolting close-ups. As explained by layout assistant Mr. Lawrence, aka the future voice actor Plankton, this dedication to the grotesque was just another day at the office for Spumco. Quote, if we're going to show a still, it better be great. It better be this great painting we can hold on, you know, and be disgusting, you know, as, d d as, as gross. And we're going to make you sit on it because it's so beautiful, but yet it's so, so gross. End quote. These gross close-ups were so iconic that a lot of other contemporary animated shows pay homage to them, like SpongeBob, Amphibia, Flapjack, and Drawn Together. The attention to detail and highly expressive animation was one of the biggest highlights of Ren and Stimpy as a series. But it was also expensive, and nearly unsustainable long term on a TV budget. Despite this, John Kay was not willing to compromise on his vision for the show. They had significant episode release delays due to the complexity of each scene. Even with shopping some of the animation out to Carbuncle Cartoons, a studio helmed by John's friends Bob Jekes and Kelly Armstrong in Canada, not to mention messing with deadlines set by the network. Episodes would be promised by specific dates, but then be delayed for months and over budget, pissing off both fans and advertisers. There's even a joke about this in The Simpsons, where there's a nomination for a Ren and Stimpy episode, but the clip wasn't finished, so they had nothing to show. Ren and Stimpy season premiere. With the first season including six episodes, Nickelodeon was now pushing for Spumco to produce 20 episodes in the second season. Now, that's not unusual for a standard season of TV, but this is Ren and Stimpy. And with how detailed the character animation gets, it was substantially more work than the crew could handle with their existing team. Quote, We weren't even very far into season two. We were already hundreds of thousands of dollars over budget and months behind schedule. I mean, we missed the air date for the very second week of Ren and Stimpy, and we had to rerun the first week cartoon. That pissed off advertisers big time. You know, because John could not let the cartoons go. End quote from Bob Camp. The feature creep was very real, and the pressure started getting to John, who was lashing out with his frustrations at the staff. He barely slept and would stay up all night at the office, obsessively combing through everybody's work. Routinely, an artist would present their finished piece to him, only for John to trash it or demand they redo a substantial amount to meet his own high standards. One of these artists, Chris Riccardi, actually called him out about this practice. Quote, I mean, at one point, I did kind of lose it and I quit. And I said, this kind of criticism does not do anything to make me better. It just, you know, makes me hate you. End quote. Now, John did apologize to him 
with Chris coming back to the studio. But the overwhelming tension was getting to everyone. Nickelodeon did not help much, often sending stories back after they had already been approved and in the storyboard phase, causing even more delays. However, the real breaking point of John's relationship with the studio, as he remembers it, was the creation of the season two episode, Man's Best Friend. In it, Rin and Stimpy are aggressively trained as champion show dogs by George Licker, a grotesque authoritarian figure with abusive father vibes. Now, for context, it is important we address something very specific about John K.'s childhood growing up. As a kid, John was absolutely terrified of his father, frequently citing his use of verbal abuse and intimidation to keep John in line. He frequently hung out by himself in the basement drawing, and often had to hide his comic books under the bed, which his father always found and damaged, claiming they would rot his brain. John cites basing a lot of George Licker's angry facial tics off his father's, struggling to suppress his own rage. Quote, so he's holding back all this violence, and I'd see his face twisting and boiling. I was like, oh shit, but it was entertaining, end quote. He also dismissed John's dreams of making it as a famous cartoonist, with John spending his adulthood working tirelessly to prove him wrong. After the season one episode Space Madness aired to widespread acclaim, he received a call from his father with a gruff but loaded congratulations. Quote, my dad, he called me and said, oh, you did it. I was wrong. You pulled it off. I don't know how. It's pretty weird stuff, but it seems like everybody likes it. But don't do the space ones. The space ones are stupid. John was asked, did you do any space ones after that? Which he replied, no. I gotten so used to obeying my dad, following his rules. End quote. Yikes. Throughout the production, the Spumco staff saw Ren's character as being a lot like John himself with all the same emotional volatility and ego issues. Additionally, John admits to basing George Licker on his own father's personality. With all this in mind, it really reframes the subject matter in Man's Best Friend in a sadder, more upsetting way. And the network thought so too. The violence used in this episode was so graphic and visceral that Vanessa intervened. She was worried that there was no way that they could air the episode without parents freaking out or losing valuable advertising deals. Nickelodeon banned the finished episode from airing, but John did not take this decision lightly. Far from it, he was majorly pissed and determined to show man's best friend by any means necessary. In a quote from Slimed, his longtime friend and colleague, Tom Minton, recalls, quote, Nick banned the episode, and John resorted to floating it as a bootleg VHS tape just to get it out there. This was all front-page news and variety, and The Hollywood Reporter in September of 1992, end quote. Furious that he went over their heads, Nickelodeon terminated their contract with John Kay in late September of 1992 replacing him with Bob Camp as the show director and Billy West filling in for both of the lead characters. Now, Nickelodeon initially offered a consulting position to John for the remainder of the series, but he refused, seeing it as selling out. Vanessa had the very unfortunate role of delivering the news to him. Quoted in Slimed, she says, I was the last person who wanted John to leave the show, but he gave us no choice. You can't be in production with a producer who's out of control. End quote. Once the news went public, Vanessa was even receiving death threats from irate fans. It became a massive, very public breakup, dividing the crew in two, with some leaving after John's firing on principle and others sticking around to work with Bob Camp, his de facto second in command at the newly created Games Animation, a studio created and overseen by Nick. The transition was simply awful, with Bob knowing some people would see him as a traitor for not sticking with his colleagues. But he was determined to not let Rin and Stimpy die a premature death due to management and budget issues. To this day, he's estranged from John, with his firing being his last day they ever spoke to each other. Bob Camp and Games Animation crew did their best to emulate John's sense of humor but they could not quite get it right. 
Viewers and critics both found the humor lackluster, and the animation missing the same panache it used to have, with seasons 3 to 5 seeing increasingly lower satisfaction from fans. Then, on December 16th, 1995, Red and Stampy had ended, finishing its original run on Nickelodeon after airing five seasons and 51 episodes. Unfortunately, Red and Stampy's ultimate downfall, or at least the massive blow to its legacy that would actually stick, would come some time after, and at the hands of the same man who was so central to the series' identity and success. And now, folks, we've arrived at the most disturbing part of the video, at least from a subject matter point of view. Now, I do have to say, for the record, that these are allegations from a legal standpoint. Sure, there is a lot of corroborating evidence to support them. But again, for the record, alleged. Okay, let's go. On March 29th, 2018, an explosive article from BuzzFeed News broke, outing John Kay as not just a sexual predator, but one with illegal tendencies. Two of his victims, Robin Bird and Katie Rice, spoke with writer Ariane Lange, describing how they were both huge childhood fans of Ren and Stimpy and wrote letters to John Kay, asking for drawing advice, wanting to be good enough to someday work on the show. Normally, these kinds of fan letters should get a polite, encouraging response back, and that would be the end of it. But sadly, it was not. John kept things going, sending them drawing supplies, sketches, and inviting them out to Spumco for a tour. And this is where things get much worse. The BuzzFeed article details that John Kay has had a history of preying on underage female fans, which started off as answering fan mail spiraled into him forming inappropriate, toxic relationships, using the success of Ren and Stimpy to keep them in his orbit. These allegations include that not only was he communicating with Robin and Katie, that he had been actively grooming them. What's worse, it was an open secret in the animation industry. Virtually everybody knew, with Robin publicly working at Spumco as a teenager. John was brazen enough that he has been photographed with both of them and exchanged tons of letters, as seen in the BuzzFeed article that Robin and Katie had saved from their youth. Both Robin and Katie did eventually work at Spumco and communicated over AOL. They shared darkly similar stories of their experiences with him, being sexually harassed and pressured into unbalanced romantic relationships by a man more than twice their age. They were both struggling through the pains of adolescence. Both Robin and Katie had low self-esteem, doubted their abilities as artists, and found the validation of a famous cartoonist as signs that they were special. Quote, I know what everybody's gonna say. Why didn't you just leave? Well, because this asshole told me when I was 13 that I was special, and I don't have any self-esteem, so I believe it." End quote. That's not to say they did not find all the positive attention weird at the time, though. As quoted in the article, Katie wrote the following in her diary around the early winter of 1996, when she was only 14 years old. Quote, I think this 40-year-old man is hitting on me, but he's never perverted. He's also very nice. He gives me a lot of drawing tips. End quote. In the summer of 1997, Robin moved in with John when she was only 16 and became his girlfriend, with a whopping 25-year age gap, where there was always conflict, with Robin detailing how at home he would complain she was nagging him and making him feel guilty, blaming her for his emotional instability. At the Spumco office, Robin cried at her desk constantly and mentally grappled with how torn she felt being there. Quote, I thought I'm getting offered a job. I'm getting offered an internship. There's someone who can take care of me. So I, I just went with it because it's, it's what I always wanted and what I thought I still wanted." End quote. After Bird left John K for good in 2002, he started pursuing Katie more avidly after ghosting her for three years. Katie had just turned 18 and had been rejected by an art school with John offering a job at Spumco to her after graduating instead. With few other prospects, Katie worked off and on at Spumco and at John's home office from 2003 to 2006 as a layout artist on Adult Party Cartoon and the Close But No Cigar music video for Weird Al Yankovic. In 2004, while working at a different job working for Disney, Katie received a series of needy emails from John asking her to date him 
saying he was jealous of her old high school crush. Eventually, the sexual harassment was too much to bear, and Katie finally left in 2007 after coming across some truly vile material on John's computer, which she immediately reported to the police. The BuzzFeed article itself gets into a lot more than I can actually say on here out of content restriction from YouTube, so I recommend reading the whole thing if you haven't seen it yet. It is very upsetting and difficult to stomach, but worth reading if you want to understand everything they went through. After the article came out, John K. put out a bizarre 11-page non-apology on his blog. He acknowledged that he had inappropriate relationships with them, but did not expand on how far things had gone. Additionally, John also brought up a mental health diagnosis he received in 2008, claiming he had both ADHD and bipolar disorder, citing they led him to be completely incapable of controlling his impulses. Yeah, that's a lousy excuse. Not only was he trying to blame his actions on mental illness, but he attempted to dredge up all the good times they used to have together while using both Robin and Katie's artwork without permission, which is just straight up gross and manipulative. Now, there are plenty of people out there who struggle with mental illness and have bad coping mechanisms for it, but that range can be alcoholism, drug abuse, emotional eating, or compulsive spending. For John, he was trying to use his devious behavior as a scapegoat while blaming his quote-unquote mental illness. This, all of this, was a long-term pattern of abusive behavior that these women will have to deal with the emotional and mental after effects for the rest of their lives. They deserve to have as much distance away from him as humanly possible and are completely within their right to never have to think about him again. A fellow YouTuber, blaming on George, has made a comprehensive video on this whole situation. So if you want to hear more about the testimonials, go check out that video. I highly recommend it. Link is in the description. Unfortunately, that's not the end of John K's story. Let's get into what happened to his creative pursuits after he was fired from Nickelodeon. Because let me tell you, it continued to go downhill. Upon leaving the original Ren and Stimpy show in 1992, John Kay continued to work in animation, but struggled to find another project that would allow him the creative freedom he desired. In the early 2000s, Spumco worked on a short-run Fox Kids TV series called The Ripping Friends, about four muscular superhero brothers fighting crime. It lasted one season before being canceled due to high production cost, averaging $400,000 an episode, and not getting the ratings to justify a renewal. After The Ripping Friends ended, John began considering reviving Ren and Stimpy in a new format that would allow him to fully explore his vision for the show. But there was some friction with this plan. Given John's history, it is no surprise that other networks were skeptical about his workplace reputation and ability to deliver episodes on time, let alone on budget. Eventually, Spike TV gave him a chance. They were looking to expand their lineup of original programming by adding in some male-oriented adult cartoons, along with Stripperella and Gary the Rat. In 2002, John inked a development deal with Spike TV to create Ren and Stimpy Adult Party Cartoon. As the executive producer and lead writer, he pledged to make a more extreme version of his classic show. They figured with a high-profile IP like Ren and Stimpy, the reboot might just be the right property to get more eyes on their network. So, how did it turn out? Bad. Like, really bad. Billy West smelled blood in the water after reading some of the scripts. He refused to return to voice Stimpy, seeing adult party cartoon as career suicide. This new iteration was so offensive and unfunny that it was canceled after only three episodes had aired. But why? Wouldn't having more creative freedom and less censorship be the right bridge to make Ren and Stimpy truly for adults? No, not really. This entire show is just the writer's fetish in disguise, with uh, no real attempts to actually conceal or disguise any of it. And it sucks. Ironically, the amount of restrictions and tightrope walking required for Nickelodeon is what made the original series humor truly thrive. In its prime, Rin and Stimpy was constantly teetering on the edge of being inappropriate, but being just restrained enough to keep people guessing how far they would go. As annoying as the censors could be, they provided a surprising amount of structure for episodes to nearly cross the line but never step over it. 
The adult audience for the reboot was turned off by the extremely crude jokes, graphic nudity, and cruel amounts of violence. With the adult party cartoon, the shock value was so frequent, it became tedious and annoying to get through. Things were gross for the sake of being gross, with Rob Owen of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette claiming, quote, they don't pay me enough to watch cartoon characters eating snot, end quote. All right, that all being said, is there anything redeeming about the show? Well, there's a notorious disturbing episode called Ren Seeks Help, where Ren tries and fails to receive therapy from Mr. Horse for his extensive psychotic issues. Also, Ren and Stimpy are canonically bisexual now, because people kept shipping them together back in the day, I guess? Okay, sure, why not? Additionally, adult party cartoons started having the same production issues that the original series did. Old habits die hard. John kept fighting with the network and struggling to get advertisers, but this time, he did not have his same reliable crew of animators he was used to, as many of his best artists had already left Spumco. The colossal failure of Adult Party Cartoon was actually the final nail in the coffin for the studio itself. Spumco was forced to shut down, officially on June 18th, 2005, as they did not have enough money to pay their affiliate studio Carbuncle Cartoons for their finished outsourced animation for the show. As of August 5th, 2020, a reboot is in the works for Comedy Central, but with one noticeable huge difference. John Kay has no involvement with its creation whatsoever. No royalties, no production credits, nothing. This reboot has been heavily delayed due to the pandemic, but it appears to be in production with both MTV and Awesome Inc., who have worked on the later seasons of Squidbillies and Your Pretty Face is Going to Hell. Very little has been revealed about where it is so far in development, but Billy West has confirmed he'll be returning as a voice actor, along with several of the other original writers. Oh, joy of joys! So, now knowing what happened, what have we learned from all of this? As a creator, John Kay has a tremendous amount of talent, passion, and drive for what he does. But he's also burned nearly every bridge in his past to get to where he is today. And I want to be very clear on this next segment. I have absolutely no sympathy for what John did as an adult, how he treated the staff, his immoral and disgusting behavior towards his vulnerable fans, getting kicked off his own show. He was a grown ass man during all of that. And there is zero justification for how he handled things with any of them. If what he shared in the documentary about how he was raised is true, then that sucks. And I really do wish things would have worked out different for him. Honestly, the amount of jokes centered around loud, authoritarian figures towering over our terrified duo leads me to believe it probably is very accurate. I didn't think about the context of that as a kid, being too distracted by the wild animation and gross-out jokes. But rewatching it now as an adult, it's pretty uncomfortable and puts a lot of other things in perspective. Being raised in an environment with an unsupportive, actively hostile parent who belittles what you're passionate about at such a young age can really do a lot of damage to a child's emotional development. Though, granted, John Kay is not the most reliable narrator and tends to downplay the extent of his own involvement with a lot of things. But because of his repeated awful decisions, he becomes the anti-hero actually the villain in his own story, and I don't think he even recognizes it. Rather than dealing with the issues head on, he redirects his own internal pain onto others in hurtful, unforgivable ways. While watching the documentary Happy Happy Joy Joy for research, it is abundantly clear just how many demons John Kay still has. He reframed his own abuse as creative inspiration for entertainment and carried that notion into adulthood without recognizing how much that damage still lingers. It absolutely does not excuse or negate any of the monstrous things he's done or how he's hurt others. Whether or not he's seriously working on getting help to address them in a substantial long-term way, uh, I really don't know. But I hope he does. I know it's dumb to say with all the garbage he's put other people through. But I really, truly hope he does. But I seriously doubt it. John's career as a showrunner is over, and justifiably so. Between the firing, public backlash, and expose pieces, he's been blacklisted from the industry, with him retiring in 2019. And there is no coming back from anything this heinous. 
Outside of that, he still posts art tutorials on his blog fairly often and seems to maybe, possibly, had a better relationship with his father until his passing in 2020. Uh, I honestly have no idea. He was also behind that whole Cal art style thing that was starting a lot of arguments online a few years ago. But now, I think it's just sour grapes since he's been out of the industry for so long. Now, I know it's kind of a meme with a lot of animated films using this plot line nowadays, but it is still true. Never underestimate the impact of generational trauma and how it can cause toxic, destructive behaviors in children. Otherwise, you will end up with a situation like this, where everyone suffers for it. The rise and fall of Ren and Stimpy was a roller coaster. Amazing highs, but devastating lows. It really makes you wonder how differently things could have turned out if he didn't keep obsessively chasing his father's approval, or how he could have redirected decades of rage and perfectionism into creating a lasting, positive environment for the staff at Spumco. But John Kay isn't built that way. Once Ren and Stimpy became a massive ratings hit, he bought into his own hype and doubled down, refusing to compromise on anything. Once he had enough power to call the shots, it was his way or the highway. John craved the validation that came from seeing Ren and Stimpy, his baby, becoming a cultural milestone for creator-driven animation. He trudged through working on lesser projects he hated and worked his way up, being mentored by legends like Bob Clampett and Ralph Bakshi. John has always struggled with setting insanely high standards for himself and his team, independent of whatever budgetary and deadline restrictions the network gave him. And when you mess with a network's bottom line by missing deadlines and biting the hand that feeds you, ratings alone will not be enough to save your show. For some, separating the art from the artist is a tough call. Problematic people frequently make great art, but it's a personal choice to still enjoy their work, independent of knowing what happened for it to be made. And if you still enjoy watching Ren and Stimpy, hey, that is totally your call. It will always be a highly influential, iconic show with a dark, checkered past. The animation landscape was never the same after it was made, and it's still one of the biggest reasons other creative-driven shows like South Park or Gravity Falls exist today. Now, I'm not certain of what to expect with the reboot, or whether or not it will even be successful, but I'm glad people working in the animation industry are being more vocal about rampant mistreatment, as they should never have to tolerate that kind of abuse. It's a long, slow road to improvement, but with the help of social media, their struggles have become more public and widely supported than ever. We can even compare John Kay's history with a more recent example, Justin Roiland, and his highly public firing from the absurdist sci-fi adult cartoon Rick and Morty. His misdeeds were also widely known in Hollywood, with more than enough horror stories to share from the women and girls he targeted. But now, Rick and Morty and its sister show, Solar Opposites, are continuing on without him. Now, whether or not they'll feel the same, independent of him, really does not matter. There is no going back. He was deservedly outed for being a massive creep, and hopefully, it will send a message to the public that their actions do indeed have consequences. Fortunately enough, both Robin Bird and Katie Rice have gone on to thrive. Despite everything in their past, Katie Rice still works in the animation industry, with her work being featured in productions like The Book of Life, DC Superhero Girls, My Life as a Teenage Robot, and The Animaniacs Reboot. For Robin, she left the industry, moving on to teach philosophy and undergraduate writing courses. Now, the wounds are still there with Robin admitting she still has nightmares about them sometimes. But mostly, she understands exactly how messed up and wrong their interactions were and still are, saying, It's not necessary for someone to be like that to create great art. You can have that going on in your head, and you can use it to make art. In fact, you can work through it with art. That's what a lot of artists do with their pain. Pain does create great art, I do believe that. But um, you don't have to keep inflicting pain to create great art. Robin, I couldn't have said it better myself.